from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. So this is uh, 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 going to be a chat about translation with, and let me uh, tell you who's up here, although they probably don't need much of an introduction. Natasha Wimmer is, uh, can I call you a full-time translator? Yeah, sure. Yeah, you might be the only one, one in of America. Few. Yeah. <laughs> well, not not entirely correct. I, I'm not entirely a full-time translator, but yes. Yeah. Go ahead. You'll have to tell us the secret of making that happen. Uh, she's best known, perhaps, for her critically acclaimed translations from the Spanish of Roberto Bolaño's *The Savage Detectives* and *2666*, -66, which clocks in at over 900 pages. Just how long did that take you to do? Uh, it was about two years, which seem, doesn't seem like very long considering. <laughs> She's translated other works, including three books by uh, Mario Vargas Llosa. She's the recipient of an NEA fellowship in translation, and you to worked on 2666 yeah, on that, and a Penn Translation Prize. Um, there's also a terrific podcast of an interview with uh, Joe Reed on the NEA website with Natasha. I encourage you to listen to. And, um, and you got your start in publishing. Yes, that's and correct. And to translation. Mm -hmm. I'm going to ask you about that. And of course, uh, Paul Oster, who also doesn't need um, an introduction, because um, as I'm sure you all know, he's one of our country's most esteemed award-winning contemporary writers. He has, I'm going to get the number wrong, 18 novels? 16. 16 novels. <laughs> the New York Trilogy, Moon Palace, The Book of Illusion, Sunset Park. You have books of poetry, you have screenplays, you've edited collection, criticism, song lyrics, um, books of essays and memoirs, and your latest one is Report from the Interior. Um, all of these are on sale at the pavilion. Um, go get your copy for your friends. And translations from the French. Do you, tr any, any other language, or do you mostly translate? Only French, okay. only French. Okay. Um, and your work itself has been translated into how many languages? I don't know, 40 something languages. <laughs> so the translation's a topic on both ends of the conversation. Yes, yeah, so we're gonna wanna yeah. ask you about that, considering that it's uh, mm. interesting to work with a living writer mm. and uh, as a translator. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> I have uh, to say about that too. I would yes. Love to talk about that. <coughs> Let me start by um, just asking you be uh, about your beginnings because Natasha, you got your start in as from publishing and moved into translation. And um, I know uh, Paul, you said you've been kind of translating f at a young age all the way through. So Natasha, how did you start us off? How did you move into well, wanting to translate? Well, um, I got into it a little bit opportunistically. I was working at the publishing company Ferris, Jazz and Drew, which is one of the great publishers of translation. And uh, I was assisting the editor-in-chief in finding translators for uh, other books. And we were having a hard time finding a translator for a Cuban novel. And, um, and I thought, well, maybe I'll give it a try. And, um, and the editor-in-chief agreed to let me do it. Um, I'm sure he would not have if I hadn't already been an employee, so it was a bit through the back door. But a lot of translators get their start that way. There really isn't any um, set path by which you become a translator. At least there hasn't been. I think it's becoming a little bit more professionalized. But um, that was one way. So can I, I have a copy of 2066. And Natasha, your name is not on the cover. It's That's, FSG, they didn't put your name on. Well, yeah, I, you know. Um, there, you know, some people think that translations sell better if the translator's name is not on the cover because they feel, because the thought is that readers um, resist the idea of reading something that's not in the author's own words or that is, um, you, know, uh, so, you know, just any sort of thing in translation. And I don't think that that's necessarily the case, but um, if it does help to sell the book, then I'm perfectly happy to have my name on the inside, I must say. Well, it's one of the things that at the NEA we're trying to get, that, you, know, you know, because we'll talk about how hard it is in the art yeah. of translation and the time and the energy and the knowledge that you need. Um, so we, we like to see the translators on the cover. So Paul, how did you be in with Well, I, I would like to say something first. I mean, just to, to emphasize the importance of translation and how people don't even, aren't even aware of how um, our culture is saturated with translation. Siri Hustvet, my wife and I were watching the evening news about 30 years ago, 
and there was a report from some town in the south which had run out of money for the Board of Education and they decided one way to save money was to eliminate the teaching of foreign languages in the school system. So they went around to the people of the town asking what they thought about it. And there was a man who actually said this, and I'm quoting directly. He said, I don't have a problem with it at all. If English was good enough for Jesus, it's good <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> think about it. Just think about what that means. Um, so, the Bible is the most popular book in America, read by more people, and I assure you it was not written in English. <laughs> um, so, that's just for beginners. And my own experience was simply this. Uh, I started dreaming about becoming a writer very early when I was a teenager in high school and I was writing stories and poems and um, when I got to college at Columbia uh, I took a very good French poetry class with a great professor Donald Frame um, it was 19th century French poetry well I loved it I was reading Baudelaire and Rimbaud and Mallarmé for the first time but it was difficult and in order to try to understand it better, I tried to translate some of it, to make sense of it for myself. And I found that that was a, just a, a very interesting thing to do. And probably the best way to read a poem is to try to translate it. Um, and then, as we were saying before, uh, a little later, I got more serious about it and did start translating contemporary French poets the example was my uncle, uh, the man married to my mother's sister, Alan Mandelbaum, who is dead now, died a few years ago. But he, you probably, maybe you know, he translated Dante, Homer, Virgil, Ovid, and then contemporary Italian poets. And so, to, well, it, that, it seemed like a legitimate activity, translation. And uh, so, <laughs> My passion for poetry led to translating lots of poems when I was young. I did a little, and thought when I was in college, anthology of surrealist poets, you know, French stuff. You know, later edited that enormous French uh, 20th century poetry, uh, a French poetry anthology for Random House. And, um, and then at some point, as a struggling young poet, essayist, uh, translated books for money, dismal books that no one has ever read, <laughs> anthropology books, history books, and you were paid you know, by the thousand words. And I remember the first job for Pantheon, $17 per thousand words, which is a th three pages, $17. You could make more money flipping hamburgers, I think. <laughs> you still can. <laughs> you still can. But still, uh, but then translation uh, after translating many things that I cared about deeply, has faded very much from my active life now. But, um, but nevertheless, I just worked on a project with a friend, uh, poems of André de Boucher, a French poet of the 20th century. Yale is doing it. It's coming out in a month or two. So, so you're keeping Still your hands in Still have my hand in, yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I want to get back to the importance of translation and how we can encourage the younger writers and MFA students and people to, to get into translation. But I want to start by talking about that the, the, there are translations and then there are literary translations. And to make the, uh, translations can be good or bad. And what makes a translation an art? Why is it difficult? What, what goes into, um, what are the struggles with it? I should say that, you know, so I'm with the uh, National Endowment for the Arts. And we are one of the biggest funders of translation. We give out fellowships for $12,500 or uh, $25,000 um, fellowships to translate works from other languages into English. And I have some bragging rights. We've done this since 1981. We've funded 350 translators. We've given out 400 fellowships We've um, to translate projects from 84 countries into 66 languages. So a lot of what we think about um, is uh, how to encourage 
good translations and to bring other um, books from other countries into English. And you know, our review criteria is uh, artistic excellence and, mm. and how well the book is rendered into English, but also the artistic merit, the importance of the work. So how do you choose which books to, to translate when, when only 3% of the books that are um, published in America are translated, which ones are brought over? And um, how much do you have to know, or does the translator know about the author, his or her oeuvre, who, the country, the language, all of that? So I want to ask you, uh, back up a little bit and talk about the art of translation um, and how much you need to know. And, and that word faithful, you know, how faithful do you need? Or is, is that desirable or even, e can that even be achieved, faith, being faithful to? Your turn. Well, the original. Those are a lot of questions. I know. A lot of big questions. <laughs> I'm setting but, the stage. Um, I think um, to speak to the question of how much the translator needs to know about the author to, trans to properly translate the book, there's a 19th century scholar of translation who had it's a very long quote that I won't remember verbatim, but he says something like, you must, um, you must have read all of the author's books. You must have lived in the country. You must have... Um, you must know the culture of the country. You must know the language of the country and the surrounding countries. Essentially, you must know everything in order to translate a book properly. Um, obviously, that can never be the case for, or that, I, I, yeah, I think I'm, I'm safe in saying that that can never be the case for a contemporary translator. Um, we strive to know as much as we can about a writer, um, uh, to read as many of his or her books as we can um, and to know as much about the culture that we're translating from, but also the culture you're translating into. Sometimes people forget about the fact that you're translating into a literary conversation and you have to think about what other books people have read, people who are reading in English have read and, and how they connect those books to what they're reading and whether, those, whether a book in translation is advancing the literary conversation, is telling them something new, but also is connecting to what they've read in English. Um, and I, I find that idea really useful, the idea of translating into a conversation. Um, and I think that that is also something helpful to think about when you decide which books to translate. A book might be you know, very important in its own culture, but it not, might not have as much to say in uh, an English language context. Um, usually, usually there has to be some sort of connection, but also some sort of strangeness, and, and finding the balance there is important. And um, there's also collaboration. You could work, do you ever collaborate with, you know, native speakers from the, but you don't? Um, I have not collaborated so much with native speakers. I've, I spent, I've spent most of my translation career translating the work of Roberto Bolaño. Um, I spent 10 years, um, and he died in 2003 just before I started to translate him, so um, was essentially translating without any kind of uh, collaboration. But um, uh, but do you do you mean with the author or do you mean with just people who are um, either? I mean, I, yeah. we I you know you could uh, pair up as um, you know I know Howard Goldblatt and his his right. They're often so they're often couple know. pairs of yeah. translators like Richard Pivier and Larissa Volkonsky translate famously from the Russian. Um, Richard Pivier is an English native English speaker. Larissa Volkonsky is a native Russian speaker, and they they're they're sort of a tag team. Um, but I, I have never worked like I've never worked that way myself. But you bring up, uh, you know, there are different theories of translation, and it's interesting to think about it. Uh, Walter Benjamin, you know, the, the famous uh, German thinker, argued that literal translations were most interesting because they would help transform the language that you were translating into. But what, what about the case of this? For example, um, say, uh, English poems, traditionally iambic pentameter. And then you confront something like a Japanese haiku. So do you want to turn the haiku into an iambic pentameter so that we would be able to absorb it? Or do you offer something new to the English language? And well, in this case, the haiku became something that is part of English now. It didn't exist. We didn't make it up. We imported it. Um, you know, do you want something to, to sound, uh, to flow and, and to be very graceful, even if you are betraying the syntax of the original. You know, these are big questions that every translator has to face. My approach was always a more practical one. You want it to sound good in English. If it's really naughty 
and impossible to comprehend, then the, the book is going to die on the page. But you don't want to betray it either. So it's a, it's a really it, it tough is, it job. Is, it's a balance. You're constantly, every sentence, you're, 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 you have this, this balancing act. Um, I, I heard, I heard um, an interesting theory, which, which is that the first couple of books by an author that you translate into a new language must be translated the way Paul said in a very, uh, in a very audience, you know, thinking about the audience and in a very, in a more interpretive way. Um, but once the author is a classic, then you, for, especially for example with retranslations, when you're retranslating, for, um, Pivir and Volokonsky, the two Russian translators I mentioned before, um, are famous for translating a bit more literally. And I think they can translate more literally because we're willing to accept a little bit more strangeness from a work that we already know is great. Um, hmm. uh, so, that so might which be is way a, to look which at is it. an argument for why retranslations are important too, and not just True. first time translations. But isn't it interesting? And this is the question that you, 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 your head spins. The book is the same book. Shakespeare is Shakespeare. You know, it was written in the 1500s and the early 1600s. We don't need to change him. But in every country in the world, you need a new Shakespeare translation every 30 or 40 years because the, um, the second language changes. And what works in 1850 is not going to work in 2014. Right. Well, that, that gives you an insight into mm. what the difference between a translation and, a, and, a, and an original uh, is. Um, I mean, I, I like to think of a translation as a reading. It's not the object itself. The, the original is the object. And then each translation is a reading. Um, and it's a reading that's very close to the object, but it's not exactly the same as the object. Um, so, for example, how might you deal with uh, slang in a, you know, or the idioms of the time? Question. Slang you is know, terrible. A great uh, question. <laughs> because, um, uh, yeah, I mean, well, you talk about the Russian novels. Uh, I remember reading Dostoevsky as a kid in the Penguin edition, David Magershak translations, and he turned all the Russian colloquialisms into Cockney colloquialisms. Which is, <laughs> which is, which is totally verboten that no one yes. would. No one does this anymore. anymore. No, yeah. no. But what's very interesting, and I think. I think Jesus spoke Cockney. Yeah. yeah. It, yes, no doubt. Before he moved to America. Yeah. Yes. Uh, um, an exemplary case is Samuel Beckett, because he wrote much of his, he was an original English speaker from Ireland, who then, after World War II, started writing in French, and then would translate his books back into English. Fascinating. So you would see that in the French works, there would be French references, which he turned in the translations into Irish references. And uh, so when I, I wrote an essay about this 40 years ago, and it was, I said something like, well, he's not translating so much as repatriating the books. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, and I mean, I think the writer has more yeah. liberty to do that. Of it's course, easier for he the can do whatever do he wants. Than he's the, he's he's the, the author. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, well, yeah. I've dealt with all kinds of horrible slang problems, and slang is not my forte. It's, it's, um, that's not what I think of as my strength as a translator, but I've had to come to terms with it because the books I've translated have tended to be very slangy. Um, the first novel I translated was um, th this Cuban novel um, by Pedro Juan Gutierrez. It's called Dirty Havana Trilogy, and it's very dirty. Uh, it, was a, it, was a really, it was a really tough Filthy first dirty. Translation. Filthy dirty. <laughs> Filthy dirty. <laughs> really yeah. um, and Bolaño is, is also, especially the first book that I translated, The Savage Detectives, is a very slangy, very, uh, and it's not just one kind of slang because Bolaño was born in Chile. He, spent his formative years in Mexico, and then he spent the rest of his life in Spain. Um, this novel is set in, in Mexico, so there's a lot of Mexican slang, but there are also characters from all over the place who speak, speak all different kinds of Spanish slang. And then, the, then Bolaño also made some slang up. He had been away from Mexico City for 20 years at that point, and so he didn't really remember necessarily exactly uh, what, what the slang was. So there, it's, it's this very, it's this very, um, wild mix of language. Um, and just to figure out where all of it was coming from in the first place was, place was difficult. Also, it's set in the 1970s. Um, I mean, I, I, the truth is I lost most of it. The, you can't tell the difference between an Argentinian and a Chilean and a Mexican in my translation. And I don't think that, I can't see that there was any practical way um, or felicitous way um, to do it. Um, but I did, I mean, I, I think one of, the, one of the theories I settled on was that I should choose slang that would have been 
appropriate in the 70s, but also didn't sound dated in um, contemporary speech. And so there's certain words that I really, I thought were really just right. I remember thinking that lousy was just the perfect word. Mm -hmm. um, That's eternal. There are a few others. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but what about yeah. those, those untranslatable sentiments or emotions, perhaps, in another language? So here's an example. I came across a term in, in Russian where, you know, they, uh, that means sadness, kind of means depression, melancholy, but this word, and I, I, it means, you know, great spiritual anguish without specific cause, an ache of soul, longing for nothing, Those longing with nothing for nothing to long for, but a longing. But it, it sort of goes on, but it, it gets deeper into not that sad, the word sadness or melancholy doesn't cut it. And this happens in every language. And I know, Natasha, you um, wrote about, it, uh, and I'll mention in a minute in our, our book, um, the uh, a term that in Spanish, if you do you ever just leave the Spanish word or the French word or the uh, what do you do? You also mentioned you it's what something about over translating um, or under translating. Right. Um, yeah. You you can sometimes leave the word in the original, especially if it has been defined somehow in the text. Um, you know, people have different feeling. Different, different people have different feelings about how much you should leave untranslated. In Spanish, it's it's um, even more complicated because there are um, Latin American writers or the, you know Mexican writer, Mexican American writers living in the United States who write in English but with a lot of Spanish, and, and um, that's a, a style of its own. So you don't necessarily want it to sound like that. Um, but um, yeah, words that can't be translated. I mean, sometimes you can translate a word with a phrase. Um, and uh, the word you're talking about specifically, I think, is um, from the Savage Detectives. It was a, a really important word in the text. Um, it was toward the end of the book. And uh, an older poet says to a couple of younger poets, is it worth it? Is it worth it? Is it really worth it? And he's talking about their lives and about poetry and about the pursuit of literature. Is it worth it? And, um, and one of the poets, one of the younger poets says, Simonel. And Simonel is a sort of nebulous Mexican, Mexico City slang term, um, which um, seems to mean yes and no at the same time. And in fact, earlier in the book, there had been a reference to Simonel, and somebody had said, what does it mean, Simonel? And they'd said, yeah, you know, C si and no, Simonel. Um, and but then I talked to some people, and they seemed, and, and a couple of people said, no, it, it, it really means yes. Um, it's, it, it, you know, it's, it's yes and no, but it's yes, it's a yes and no that means yes. Um, <laughs> and so then, you know, then I, I, I was, an, you know, I was doing a literary analysis trying to figure, decide which, whether yes or no was more fitting, you know, fit better fitted the themes of the novel. You know, was was Bologna really saying that literature was the pursuit of literature was worth it, or was he saying that it wasn't? Um, and, uh, and that was getting very sticky. I didn't, you know, I didn't want to make that decision for Bologna. Um, uh, and finally, I decided to leave it to Simonel because it had been referred to earlier in the book, and I could. Um, and, and at the time, it felt maybe like a little bit of a cop out, but I think it probably was the right decision. Wait, I have to ask you: How often do you Google synonyms? Oh, all the time. I use, I use Google all the time. What did we constantly. do before Google? I don't know. How did we translate? We had dictionaries. <laughs> <laughs> language is so devious. Uh, this yes-no thing reminds me of a hilarious story from uh, my days at Columbia in the 60s. Sidney Morgan Bessett was a philosophy professor there famous for his wit and intelligence. And he was um, uh, attending a lecture by a linguist. And the linguist said, well, it's curious that in language, uh, you know, a double uh, negative can mean a positive, but a double positive can never mean a negative. And Morgan Bessie was standing there and he went, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> How do you translate that? <laughs> Very good question. Very good question. So, has your you guys have been translating a long time? So, have you, you know, you've learned a lot. I, I'm assuming. So, as the things change for you, I'm 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 actually looking for, to Natasha because you, you know, I read in an interview that you said you feel freer to perhaps depart from a text. But am I getting that right? I now? do. I do feel freer. I mean, I think in the beginning. I always felt that 
uh, you know, uh, um, either the author or a professor was looking over my shoulder as I was translating, and I, I just always imagine that someone reading my English translation and comparing it to the Spanish. Um, but the truth is, almost no one will ever read my translations and compare them to the Spanish. And for most people who read my translation, it will be the only version of the book that they'll ever read. Um, and so just gradually over the years, it sunk in that, that um, even though I know how close or how far it is from the Spanish, the most important thing for the reader is just that it live as its own, um, live a, as a book on its own, uh, that, it, that, it, that it work independently from the Spanish. Um, so I just want to say, in your defense, that <laughs> translators are the great heroes of literature, and they really are unsung. And, um, and, the, and the fact is, most translators, you know, and, and especially someone in your position translating an internationally known writer, the translations are very rarely mentioned in the reviews, except to criticize. You know, oh, she made a mistake on page 326. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a tough thing when, um, the, the, the reviewers uh, tend not to talk about the quality of the translation and why the translation is making that book so absorbing to read in English. It's true. I mean, it can be discouraging. But in defensive reviewers, I would say that it's really hard to review translation, especially if you haven't been a translator yourself. And a lot of reviewers, of course, just don't yeah. speak the language. And right. That's the end of it right there. But even if you do speak the language, to, to, to see wh what, where the translation is, to, to identify the translation through the work is sometimes difficult. Well, about 30 years ago, when the National Book Awards still had a translation category, I was one of the judges. And my big question was this. Do I vote for the book that is the best book, the best piece of literature, or the best work of translation? That's an interesting question. And I really couldn't decide. Yeah. And uh, it was a very difficult Which thing to Which is why deal we with. have both review criteria yeah. at the end. Yeah. This might be a good time. How's this for a, a commercial break? This is free in the back of the room, and it has Natasha's essay in it. This is a book that the NEA just came out with. It's a book of very short essays, very accessible. We wanted to celebrate. It's called The Art of Empathy, Celebrating Literature and Translation. Uh-huh. And uh, <laughs> it's, we really just wanted to highlight what they're talking about and, and these unsung heroes and what goes into translation. And Natasha talks about just what um, you know, translate in uh, Bolaño, and there's all sorts of um, different essays about uh, uh, these wonderful people who translate. So, the, and, and the, we have lots of copies in the back of the room. Mm, this is also free. One. You could get off of our website. You mm. can um, print it. There you go. Um, we, we, I want to get to the question of working as a translator with a, a living writer. And being a writer, have you worked, I'm going to start with you, have you worked with translators to, do you want to be separated from that oh, process? Oh, no, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm open to anything. I want, I want my books to be translated as well as possible. Therefore, when any of my translators contacts me, I, I go into long explanations about what a particular word or phrase will mean. Are you intimidating? No, it's not intimidating <laughs> at all. I mean, we're doing this by letter uh, or fax or, you know, it's not, um, uh, generally face to face, although in the only language you see in which I can actively participate is French. That's the language I know best. And I've gotten quite involved in the last few books to make sure that they're right. And then it, I, I remember a nine hour conversation on the phone with my editor a few <laughs> months ago going over the translation. And we didn't finish. And we had to have another six hours the next day. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I get absorbed in it. Do you, you have a say in who the translator is? Not or really. No, 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 okay. No. And do you find that most often they contact you with questions? No, I'm oh. surprised at how few yeah. do. Uh, <laughs> um, I've never had um, a question from either one of my Spanish translators, for example. Hmm. But my German translator's in touch, the French translator's in touch, the Italian is in touch. But not the Spanish, and the books do very well in Spain, so I just assume they're great <laughs> translations. And these people are geniuses. And, uh, I mean, uh, but then, it's, I'm, it's very interesting to me to hear all this from your perspective, because of course I'm always on the other side. Um, but I just wonder if all of your translators came to you with questions, wouldn't that take up your entire 
life because you're, no, you're, so, you're so widely translated. But they don't. <laughs> um, but I, I was but thinking, if they did, you might have to. But you know, I was up. thinking about this, and I think one or two writers that I know have done this. I'm writing a big novel now. It's going to take me a few more years to, to finish. And I had a feeling that it might be interesting when I'm done to get together for a weekend with, with as many translators as could get, we could gather together in one place and go through the whole thing. That's a great idea. It you is know? a great idea. Just talk about the, the difficulties of that paragraph or that sentence and so that the German and the Chinese person could both you know, understand what they're doing. So what's uh, your, you, I, I'm taking note as the MEA. What, um, have you, do you prefer working with um, women or you don't? Uh, yeah, yes and, yes and no. I mean, um, <laughs> there, there, there are good things about uh, both, both sides. I mean, we're, you know, because I worked for 10 years with, without an author to consult, I got kind of used to that. Um, and it, and it um, I mean, it's nerve wracking because there are some things that you'll just never really know. And, but it's also a little bit liberating because you don't feel as, you know, you know, you don't have my paranoid feeling that the author is, is going to take me to task for every, you know, mistake I make. Um, but I had a really, really rewarding exchange with Marcos Giral Torrente, who is the author of a memoir that I just translated, and it was intense. We spent, you know, it was similar to your nine-hour conversation, except I think we spent probably, it was a week, it was a good solid week of exchanges. Um, and it was mostly over very small questions, very small wording questions. Um, but it was it was illuminating, and um, and I think that it improved the book. Um, so it can be it can be wonderful. But, I mean, it's 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 scary because usually you're far away from the author, um, and you um, you know the first con the first real contact you have with them, at least in my case, is when you're done translating the book and you send them a list the initial list of questions. And there's just a sense that if you ask one dumb question, then they're going to uh, they'll lose all faith in you and any other questions you ask, no matter how smart they are. Has that happened? Um. Well, yeah, I mean, it, is, it, can get, it can get discouraging when the translator asks you, who's Daniel Boone, for example? Um, but then again, why should a European know who Daniel Boone is? But even worse than those sort of factual questions is when you misinterpret some, something emotionally oh, or, or aesthetically. Or completely or just, yes. opposite. Um, to, but of course, those are the questions you really need to ask. Yeah. That you know, those are the things that you need to have corrected. So, and hopefully, over the course of your correspondence, the, the author comes to see that you know you're not all. It's, it's not all bad. But, uh, <laughs> have you have you been stumped by a question, or is something illuminating that you didn't think of? There are things that are so difficult to translate that um, um, you can't really find a, an ideal solution, and you have to make some kind of compromise. You know, if, if a sentence has two or three meanings in English, and there are sentences like that, and one works very hard to achieve them, and then in the translation, there's only one meaning. You have to go for one. And uh, that can be demoralizing. But then you look for other places in the text where maybe you could do something similar, which doesn't exist in the original, but you can make something interesting happen in the translation. Um, I remember often trying to do that as a translator. Yes, definitely. Yeah. You know, you add yeah. some here and take some away there. And yeah. yeah. Hopefully it all. So we have about 10 minutes, and I want to make sure that I, I'm going to invite questions from the audience. Um, but so as you make your way to the microphones, I'm going to just ask a question just to finish up. Uh, you know, we think about, at the NEA, we think about um, making sure there are more translations, that the translations out there are sell better, that, you know, and there are all these hurdles, as you said, you know, for the tra someone to get involved at the beginning to translate, MFA students, writers, anyone translating, it's intimidating to think that they have to know the language, the full, every, all of that. Um, it's it's uh, expensive to publish translations often because you of course have to pay for the to the, the payments to the writer and the translator and then because they don't put the translator on the cover there's this distrust of publishers thinking they won't sell as well and and so there's all of these hurdles that you know we work at the NUA to to overcome so I'm going to ask you sort of in thinking of the field of literature um, if, at the very least how can we encourage young Writers well, to you see, the, the, we were talking about this before we started. Uh, the numbers that I seem to know is that the 
of all the books published in the United States in any given year, 3% are translations, which seems to be disastrously low. And in a country like Germany, which is a very in intense literary culture, 50% of the books are translated. There's a hunger in other places about other cultures, which we in America seem to have given up on. And uh, it's a little distressing. And I think just, not just for the literature that we're missing, but also the understanding of other cultures that we're missing, it's important to encourage students to study languages and to translate. And uh, maybe there could be programs sponsored by people like you at the NEA, really encouraging people to do this. I mean, we, we encourage people to go into uh, rocket science eh, for the Defense Department. Well, I think this is just as valuable as anything the Defense Department can do about making the country <laughs> more open and, and trying to understand the rest of the world. I, I, I will say, at when many years, many, many years ago, when I got my MFA at American University, there's probably some students out there, that they, I took a class, they encouraged me to take a class in translation. I did not, I was not bilingual, I didn't speak, I mean, I studied Russian and French, but I didn't, you know. <coughs> but taking that class and trying my hand at translating opened up a world for me in my own writing, and I, I would like to see more MFA programs. As your parent encourage. always said, every young poet should translate. It is the, uh, one of the greatest exercises possible, so. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Hi, um, my name is Denise. I'm from Argentina. Uh, I'm also a translator, and I have a question for Natasha. Um, you said maybe the Spanish slang was a little bit lost in your translation. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to know about what were the things that you thought were gained in translation. What about Bolaño sounded more interesting or playful in English? Hmm, I don't know about gained in translation, although um, there is a section in the, the novel 2666 that is told from, from the perspective of um, an African-American journalist from Harlem who's traveling in Mexico. And that was a really, really difficult thing to translate because Bologna hadn't made any effort to make this guy sound American. But the question was how, you know, how American and how Harlem and how, you know, how, what should he sound like? Mm -hmm. um, and my editor really encouraged me to, to pump it up a little bit and make him sound a little bit more, a little bit more um, slangy maybe than he did in the Spanish. Um, so there, in that case, maybe we did add a little bit, um, you know, and hopefully in a, in a judicious way. We, I'm going to move a little bit more quickly because we have five minutes, and I think you guys were here. Go ahead, and then we'll move to you. A uh, question to both Paul and Natasha. Have you ever thought of translating from English into Spanish? Uh, or French? Or French, yeah. In English into French. Um, Do you feel capable of it? No. It's, um, I, I've tried. I've done it um, just for fun. But my um, knowledge of French is a more passive knowledge. I, I can't really write very well in French. Um, so, I think there are people who are perfectly bilingual, Beckett being, being the example. But he, it took him years to get to that point. Early on, with all his French work, he needed French people helping him with the grammar, even. Um, and I just have never dedicated myself to that pursuit. I don't know. What about you? Oh, no, I can't do it. No, no. <laughs> uh, yes. Hello, this is a question for both panelists. My name is Heidi Lee Feldman. Um, do you have thoughts about the issue of translating from English to English? And what I'm specifically thinking of here is Indian English to for Americans. And I have a particular example, which I'd like to quickly run by you. So I sometimes am asked to do this. And the hardest thing is when an Indian writer writing in Indian English writes, she nodded, because that's probably this. I can't really do it. No, this but, is not. But, yeah. but, is but I can't, well, in, I can't, what you sometimes see Anglo, uh, British writers or English, from England writers do, they translate as waggled, which is terrible because it immediately <laughs> trivializes the character to an American ear. So that's the sort of problem I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about. Well, I think th what I would say is that you're, tra you're translating the sense, not necessarily the word. So I think you should forget about nodded and just try to, you know, try to find the best word you can for the action itself. Um, that would be my advice. There are so many Englishes that are spoken around the world 
And some of them, for example, Scottish, I cannot understand. <laughs> and when I see a movie with Scottish characters, I really need subtitles often because I can't, I can't crack what they're saying. So um, English is a big problem. <laughs> 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 Yes. Well, you know what else I would say yeah. is that sometimes as a, tr as a translation exercise, because I teach translation too, I do have students translate from English to English. Oftentimes, you know, a 17th century text or something into contemporary, oh. contemporary English. That's interesting. So, yeah. Hello, my name is Keith Cohen, and I'm an old friend of Paul Auster's. Hey, so, Keith. <laughs> <laughs> so my question profits from personal knowledge about having gone to college with Paul and then being one of his poet, poet buddies in Paris. But I'm going to ask a question which I hope has general interest. Paul, when we knew each other well in Paris, and you were translating people like de Boucher and so on, um, you were there for maybe two years? Yeah, two no, years. I was in France for four years. OK, so you were there for four years. And you remember John Ashbery's famous comment that when he was the Paris editor for the Herald Tribune? The art the, critic. The yeah. art critic for yeah. the Herald Tribune, that he was away from France, uh, from the US for something like five years, I think. I think 10, even. May, so you right. see, you know the details of yes, the story better yes. than I do. But my question is, when he came back, he says, he claims to have said, he has said in many interviews, that his hearing of the English language had radically changed from something like 55 to 65, I forget the exact years. That the English language for John Ashbery, who is important poet, right, um, had so changed that it, it changed his understanding of how to write in English. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if that happened to you. That's interesting. Well, I wasn't away as long, and I was also living with someone who was an American. So we were speaking English to each other, and we saw a lot of Americans coming through Paris uh, during those years. So I didn't feel so isolated from my own language. On the other hand, what I missed and I think what really drove me to come back to New York, I missed hearing English, American English in the streets and on the buses and in the subways, overhearing those little snatches of conversation that make life in a city so compelling. And uh, it's all in French, very interesting. I understood it, but it wasn't helping me as a, as a writer. And uh, so I, I wanted to return to my language coming back. I'm afraid we only have time for one, maybe two more questions. I'm, I'm so sorry, but yes, we'll go here. This is for Natasha. First of all, thank you for translating 2666. It was an incredible journey oh, to read you. it. Um, and my question <laughs> is about that book. Um, there are parts of it that I don't understand. <laughs> and um, particularly the section with the triangles, the philosophical triangles in the middle of the book, I've done, in, it, they haunt me. And I've done enormous amount of thinking and researching of all those philosophers to try to connect it to the rest of the book. And I think I'm still failing to connect it. So my question is, when you're translating something, do you always, under, do, do you always understand <laughs> that? And when you don't understand something in a book like 2666, how do you resolve that dilemma? Oh, I certainly don't always understand something. And the truth is, you probably know more about those triangles than I do, especially at this point, since it's been a while. Um, the question of things that you don't know, one, one, I, one aspect of the, of the problem is that sometimes the writer doesn't necessarily mean for the reader to understand it. The, the, the point, I think this is especially true in Bologna, that, that um, he's cultivating a mystery. And the mystery is maybe more important than, um, or at least that's my interpretation of it, than, than um, any analysis you could make of it. Um, but the question then is, at, when you're translating, um, do you, how, you know, how, how, when you're translating, you always to some extent are clarifying and interpreting. But you have to know, when, when, you're, when you're translating something that's intended to be mysterious, you have to back off a little bit. Because sometimes it's possible, and that speaks to the question of over-translating. Sometimes you can make something clearer than it should have been, than it was, than the writer intended it to be. Um, and I, I feel like I'm sort of answering your question backwards and, and making it worse instead of better. Um, but, um, and maybe I'm also trying to cover up the fact that, in fact, I just don't, there are many things that I don't understand and I just don't have time to, to fully dedicate myself to researching. Um, so I, I hope that answers your question a little bit. <laughs>
I'm sorry, we have no more time. I want to, I'm so sorry, I want to thank Paul and Natasha, and thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.